Good day everyone. Our topic today about rhinoplasty, otoplasty, facelift. And this is the lecture 2. Facial cosmetic surgery. You can see the playlist about facial cosmetic surgery. The upper facial third is an often overlooked component of the aging face despite its tendency to show age-related changes prior to any other facial regions. The eyelids, brow, and forehead together form the upper facial aesthetic unit, and the degree and architecture of age-related deformities can differ greatly among patients. Upper facial third. Rhinoplasty and rhinodectomy facelift have been the most publicized operations for facial rejuvenation. Rhinoplasty rhinodectomy. Successful performance of brow and palpebral procedures often precede correction of middle and lower facial deformities. The reason for this is that the brow and upper lids begin to show age-related changes as early as the third and fourth decades as opposed to the fifth and sixth decades, which is characterized by cervicofacial deflation and deep-ridded formation. Ptosis of the brow and palpebral skin is an inevitable part of the aging process and is the result of a combination of static and dynamic forces leading to the descent of the brow and malposition of the periorbital structures. 1. Brow and forehead lift, in some cases in severe ptosis, a long forehead, or receding hair line, the traditional mini open brow lift approach can be used to provide generous access for mobilization and lifting of the brow and forehead. Technique. A trichophytic incision, avoiding damage to hair follicles, is placed behind the hairline and a full thickness scalp dissection is used to undermine, mobilize, and elevate the forehead and brow one. Brow and forehead lift. This has largely replaced the coronal incision in terms of open brow lifting and allows the brow lift to be performed without increasing the forehead length. Note the slightly increased forehead height in this patient after coronal brow lift. So, patients who present with an increased forehead length preoperatively, the trichophytic approach is preferred. Most brow lift and forehead procedures are performed endoscopically. Endoscopic surgery is performed by using multiple small incisions within the hair bearing area. Endotrichophytic approach. The forehead and brow tissues are undermined and suspended in a superior position with the use of extremely small bone screws. Recovery from an endoscopic brow lift takes typically 5 to 7 days. In females, it's critical to lifting the lateral third of the brow more than the medial third, this should recreate the aesthetically pleasing arch intrinsic to the ideal female brow. The medial aspect of the brow begins tangential to a line drawn from the alar base of the nose vertically through the medial canthus of the eye. The tail of the brow ends tangentially to an oblique line drawn from the alar base of the nose through the lateral canthus of the eye. The apex of the brow falls somewhere between the lateral limbus, junction between the cornea and the sclera, and the lateral canthus of the eye. Ideal. Female brow. In men, more even elevation over the entire length of the brow is necessary to recreate the more typical masculine brow form. Complications of endoscopic brow lift. Complications are rare but they can include. Mild discomfort hematoma asymmetry excessive elevation of the head of the brow relapse paresthesia temporal nerve branch weakness. 2. Blepharoplasty age-related changes occur in periorbital structures as early as the third or fourth decade of life, making blepharoplasty or eyelid tuck one of the earliest facial cosmetic surgeries many patients undergo. This is because the eyelid skin is the thinnest on the body and is constantly in motion. With skin laxity and pseudogenization of orbital fat due to a weakened orbital septum, patients complain of baggy or puffy eyes or a tired look. Dermatochalysis is defined as skin laxity of the upper or lower lids as a result of aging. Blepharocholysis is laxity and thinning of the eyelid skin due to recurrent episodes of lid edema from an unknown etiology. Both can lead to lateral hooding too. Blepharoplasty. Lateral hooding which is a prolapse of the upper lid skin over the lateral aspect of the eye and the crow's foot area. B. Old techniques. Depends heavily on liberal removal of herniated fat in the upper and lower lids. 
Extensive fat removal often provides initially pleasing results but may lead to a hollowed appearance that can be difficult to correct. Blepharoplasty techniques. Modern techniques. Focus more on judicious removal or repositioning of fat to preserve volume. Blepharoplasty techniques. Upper lid blepharoplasty involves removing the redundant skin and occasionally muscle. If fat is to be removed, it must be done carefully and is usually confined to the nasal fat compartment only. Reduction of the medial or nasal fat pad in the upper lid. Strict hemostasis must be ensured during this component of the surgery to prevent orbital hematoma. Over-aggressive resection of the orbital fat will result in a treated and hollowed-out effect of the upper eyelid and should be strictly avoided. A drooping, hepatic, lacrimal gland may give the appearance of fat herniation in the lateral aspect of the upper lid. This will require repositioning of the gland with suture techniques. The upper lid incision is hidden in the lid crease and once fully healed is nearly imperceptible. Although lower blepharoplasty is commonly combined and discussed with upper lid blepharoplasty, it is useful to consider it as part of the middle facial third. With aging, both hard and soft tissues lose prominence in the cheek and malar areas. Middle facial third. 1. Lower blepharoplasty. The lower lid itself may be treated in several ways. Two of the most common techniques used are the transconjunctival approach and the subsidiary approach. 1. Lower blepharoplasty. 1. Transconjunctival approach. The incision is made inside the lower eyelid and prominent fat is sculpted or repositioned. Skin laxity can then be treated with either chemical or laser resurfacing versus actual skin excision. 1. Lower blepharoplasty. 2. Subciliary approach. Involve an incision just below the lash line of the lower eyelid to gain access to the prominent fat compartments. The skin is then red rot, and any excess is carefully trimmed away 1. Lower blepharoplasty. Postoperative recovery after a typical blepharoplasty takes approximately 7 to 10 days, with minimal postoperative discomfort. Significant complications are very rare but may include 1. Dry eye syndrome or xerophthalmia. 2. Asymmetry 3. Orbital hematoma, which, on extremely rare occasions, can lead to blindness if not identified and treated promptly. Midfacial or malar and submalar implants have gained popularity in recent years primarily because of the difficulty and unpredictability of restoring midfacial volume through suturing or conventional lifting techniques. Middle facial third. 2. Midfacial implants. As people age, the fat pads of the cheek region atrophy and descend. This, combined with gradual loss of skeletal volume and support, leads to flattening of the cheek. Some patients have congenital midface volume deficiency, which can lead to a more aged appearance as well. Types of midfacial implants 1. High density porous polyethylene materials 2. Solid silicone implants 2. Midfacial implants Advantages of midface implants 1. Cheek implants are typically anatomic, i.e., they adapt closely to skeletal norms or may be custom designed with the aid of three-dimensional computed tomography CT. 2. Midfacial implants. 2. Solid silicone midface implants are popular because of their safety and tolerance by human tissues. 3. Solid silicone implants are solid but flexible and forgiving. 4. It's easy retrievability 5. As with any implantable device, the body encapsulates the implant. This collagen encapsulation promotes the stability of the implant. Cheek implants may be placed into position either through a lower lid incision or more commonly through an intraoral incision in the maxillary vestibule. 2. Midfacial implants. 6. These implants are usually undetectable by the patient once fully healed and immobilized by encapsulation 7. Many surgeons elect to fix the implants in position with small titanium screws to maintain the proper position until complete encapsulation occurs at 6 to 8 weeks. 8. Because the silicone implant is smooth and flexible and not porous like other facial implants which promote soft tissue ingrowth, 
it can be removed with relative ease too. Midfacial implants. With the removal of hard porous implants, porous polyethylene, an increased risk of fragmentation and injury to adjacent tissues exists too. Midfacial implants. Rhinoplasty. Rhinoplasty is one of the more commonly performed cosmetic surgery procedures. Corrective nasal surgery is performed for a variety of functional and cosmetic purposes and is performed on patients as early as the teenage years. Nasal anatomy. When performed properly, rhinoplasty can dramatically improve the appearance of the patient. An elegant nose is one that is symmetrical and proportional to the face. This allows the observer's eye to focus on other facial features such as the eyes or the smile, which are the predominant conveyors of emotion among all the features of the human face. In short, the ideal nose is hardly noticed. Patients who have undergone successful rhinoplasty often remark that friends and family comment more about the eyes or the smile than about the nose, even if the results are fairly dramatic when compared with the preoperative appearance of the nose. Rhinoplasty is traditionally performed either through the one open approach or the two closed approach. In the closed approach, all incisions are intranasal, and much of the manipulation of the underlying nasal skeleton is performed blindly or with limited vision. The open approach incorporates similar intranasal incisions with a columellar incision, which allows full uncovering of the nasal skeleton. This allows better visualization and more precise alteration of the nasal cotyledges. Both techniques are useful, and their applications are largely dependent on the surgeon. As a general rule, Revision or more difficult rhinoplasties requiring grafting or significant cartilage-altering maneuvers are usually performed with an open approach. Rhinoplasty allows the surgeon to reduce a prominent nasal hump by reducing the bony components, the cartilaginous components, or both. Septoplasty, which is the alteration of the nasal septum is commonly performed simultaneously to harvest cartilage for grafting purposes straighten a crooked or deviated nose, or improve airflow through the nose. Preservation or replacement of nasal support is vital in rhinoplasty to avoid postoperative breathing problems or nasal valve collapse. Nasal dressing usually includes taping of the nose and placement of a rigid external splint for one week. Intranasal packing is rarely required, which makes recovery much more tolerable. Recovery typically requires one to two weeks of recovery because of ensuing edema and bruising. Subtle changes to the nasal tip, if modified, can occur as late as one year. However, most results are fully appreciated at two to three months. A. Patient with prominent dorsal hump and inadequate tip elevation. B. After rhinoplasty with reduction of a prominent hump and tip elevation. She also underwent simultaneous mandibular advancement. It is quite common to combine corrective jaw surgery with rhinoplasty. Otoplasty, prominent or cupped ears can be a source of insecurity and awkwardness for many patients. This is especially a concern in school-aged children who are ridiculed for having big ears. Otoplasty, it is also common for a young female to be unable or unwilling to wear her hair in a ponytail because of her prominent ears. Because of these psychosocial concerns, many surgeons recommend having otoplasty at a fairly young age to avoid some of the problems discussed. The etiology of prominent ears is usually a combination of an underdeveloped antihelical fold and overgrowth of the conchal bowl. The external ear completes nearly all of its growth by 7 to 8 years of age, which allows surgery to be performed safely and predictably at that age. Surgical correction typically involves exposing the ear cartilage through a postericular incision. The excess cartilage is either totally excised or thinned, and the ear is often reshaped by scoring of the cartilage and suturing techniques to allow further molding. After surgery, it is common to place a bolster dressing in a mastoid wrap. This dressing helps protect the surgical site and reduce swelling. That's the second lecture about facial cosmetic surgery, and will be more lectures soon. Click the like button and subscribe for more dentistry lectures and dental vlogs. Clinical cases live are available exclusively on the YouTube channel, Lectures Dentist.
Also, you can support my channel through the link in the description. Good day everyone. Art